Welcome to another edition of DT Live. Hope everyone is doing all right this morning. For those of you hanging out in the YouTube chat, give me a yay or nay on the audio. All right. I'm going to have to wait about 20 seconds because of the delay to get a response. I'm assuming the audio is working. Usually these solo streams, the audio typically just works. Yeah, you guys can hear me. It's usually the desktop audio that's a problem. It's me recording my desktop or, you know, me recording videos or me recording Jitsi or Zoom call or Discord, things like that. That's usually the issue. Yay. Yay on the audio. All right. So obviously the title of this, this stream is yet another pointless distro or if you want the uh, actual title, DTOS GNU slash Linux. I created uh, of course, DTOS is a post-installation script for Arch Linux-based distributions. I've been doing that for two or three years, maintaining a repository of software. And basically, the idea of the post-installation script was me having a distribution, essentially, that wasn't really a distribution. It's not an ISO. Uh, therefore, you can put it pretty much on any existing Arch-based distribution, which I thought was kind of neat, kind of innovative, comes with a ton of headaches, right? I, I Doing it the way I was doing it, you know, I, I think it, it could work. It's a nice model. I think more people should maybe make distributions like that. Um, but it, in reality, in practice, it, it, it causes a lot more headaches than just building an ISO, right? just basing off of one distribution. Because when I build an ISO, of course, I build it off of mainline Arch. And then I get less variances among, you know, this person did the DTOS post installation script on Manjaro. This person did it on Garuda. This person did it on Arco. And, you know, all these different, you know, there's a, a dozen different Arch based distributions out there that are rather popular there's actually probably 100 out there but you know at least a dozen that are very popular and I'm, I'm trying to support support requests for people that install dtos on a wide variety of distributions that each came shipped with various packages installed naming conflicts of my packages versus their packages and it just got to the point where you know even though i kind of resisted doing the whole iso thing I decided just to make an ISO. <laughs> so uh, let me open my browser here. So I went ahead and I I've built ISOs of DTOS before, uh, not necessarily in a serious sort of way. And I never put them out on the uh, on SourceForge or anywhere public for you guys to download. But I actually built an ISO and it's available on SourceForge. Link is in the show description. Uh, what this is, this is DTOS with Qtile just the Qtel window manager that's another thing i wanted to do i didn't want to ship with a million different window managers um the dtos script the post installation script i gave you guys uh five different window managers to choose from although i really recommended you guys just using xmonad because that was what i was living in most of the time so that's the only window manager that i really lived in and i like if bugs cropped up i knew about it i don't use dwm or awesome or BSPWM that often. Like I don't log into those window managers very often. So if things are broken, I'm not going to notice them. And so what I decided to do, again, just to make things easier on my life, I use Qtile every day, at least right now. <laughs> and probably for the foreseeable future, I'm going to live in Qtile for a while. So I'm just going to make DTOS for Qtile. I've still got Xmonad configs, so don't worry. And if you've already installed DTOS with the post installation script, you've already got um, you've, you've already got the Xmonad configs. They're not going away, right? So you're fine. Just know that you know when I'm building these ISOs, I'm not actually going to put Xmonad and all of that on these ISOs. Let me go back to the chat, and then we'll get into. I'll spin up a virtual machine, and we'll actually. Fire up that ISO, maybe run through a quick installation. Please show more fork bomb viruses. Uh, the fork bomb video, yeah. I'm surprised people were that interested in the fork bomb. I think I showed the fork bomb. Of course, I showed it, obviously, with Bash, because um, that's what most people know about, right? And I explained why that Bash fork bomb works, what the, all the, the characters mean. 
but you can actually do a fork bomb in practically every programming language and scripting language. And you, you can do a fork bomb with C or with Haskell or with Python. So if you're interested, yeah, I mean, you, you can fork bomb a thousand different ways. I've been playing with DTOS for a few hours now. Pretty cool. Ah, good to hear. And did you in install it via the ISO? I, I noticed uh, about two dozen of you guys have downloaded it here this morning. So some of you guys are going to try it out, which is cool. Uh, I, I told people when I first created the post installation script, you know, a couple of years ago, the DTOS install script, told you guys it's essentially beta software. I don't want to support it necessarily. I really don't have time, so I basically said, hey, I created this thing, please don't use it. So I'm going to do that with the ISO too. The ISO's there, use it. it, it works. But just know, if you need support, you know, I, 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 there's no 24-7 support, right? If you ask a support question, you may be waiting a while for a response sometimes. Essentially though, it's Arch Linux, right? At the end of the day, um, there's a, obviously I have my own repository of software with some specific DTOS only packages. So, you know, some of that stuff I'll, I'll definitely support because that's my stuff if it's broken, you know, but like if you have weird questions like, I don't know, setting up some service or daemon that doesn't ship with DTOS out of the box, you know, I'm, I'm just going to tell you RTFM, right? Go read the Arch Wiki. So, uh, most of the time. Like if it's something I can answer really quickly, you know, like in one or two sentences, but if I got to type out a couple of paragraphs to describe something that's already been written in the Arch Wiki, you know, that's typically what I'm going to do. Yeah, some guy did a fork bomb in assembly. Yeah, I think you can even do a fork bomb in awk, right? If you still script in awk. So. Yeah, Zero Linux, he's in the chat. So is Big Pod. How you doing, Big Pod? Yeah, host Grady, some guy did a fork bomb, yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh! Master is also in the house. Lots of familiar faces. Well, let me switch over to my uh, virtual machine desktop here. I've already got this virtual machine created here in Vert Manager. And I've got the ISO downloaded. So let's fire it up. So we get our boot menu, just an Arch Linux boot screen. If you've seen Arch Linux, the boot menu you've seen. Only thing different is the theming, obviously. And let's go ahead and boot up. Now, booting the live ISO does take a little, little time here. I'm not sure why. Um, this, I don't think this was a issue the last time I had built an ISO and uh, you know did something on camera. But there is, for some reason, once it gets to the part where it's going to start SDDM, it hangs for a bit. It, you might have to wait. 15 20 seconds for sddm to start here it is sddm starting we're gonna sit here at this black screen for probably about i don't know what seems like 10 maybe 20 seconds now that black screen hanging there if you're trying it off the iso on a live usb stick or here it may be a virtual machine only problem i haven't tried it off a live usb stick just know this is just running it live after it's installed it doesn't hang like this I got my coffee this morning. Stopped by Whataburger for breakfast, not McDonald's. Whataburger does really good breakfast. Hmm. Wonder if it's an entropy problem, like there needs to be some mouse movement or some keyboard strokes. I'm not sure what's going on. I suspect though it has probably something to do with the like the network um, services starting. I don't know. Not exactly sure how SDDM works under the hood as far as what it waits on as far as things to start there is i mean i have a mouse cursor so it's obviously we've already got xorg kind of loaded it's just sddm hasn't finished loading yet okay well there it goes all right and the session the default session of course is qtile there's only two sessions on the iso uh, qtile and if i click on qtile Oh, it's really slow. 
Now that's probably just a virtual machine problem, the animation there. Uh, Qtile Wayland is the other option. Obviously, there's no Wayland stuff on the ISO of my Qtile config. It's not built with Wayland in mind. So if you want to try Wayland, obviously make sure you install all the Wayland stuff. Um, and you're going to have to change some of the configs. So, uh, the live user in DTOS already defaults to that. Uh, password DTOS. Yeah, Zero Linux is the uh, Pac-Man init takes a while. Yeah, it could be the Pac init service. I suspect it's either the Pac-Man init service or uh, some of the networking services. Uh, Network Manager, which I don't use. I'm using Network D. But, you know, some of those init services. One of them is taking a minute. It would make sense for Pac-Man to be the problem. Pac-Man, if you guys have ever um, had your terminal window open and just have HTOP open, watch what happens when your package manager decides it's going to check for an update. Like if you have PAMAC or Octopi or whatever, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be an Arch-based distro. Whatever your, whenever your apt package manager pacman dnf decides to check for an update your cpu spikes to like 100 percent. it takes a lot of cpu right when it runs that update so a lot of times those kinds of things do slow things down uh, okay so the calamaris installer opens automatically full screen um, it is a tiling window manager so it's going to be full screen and then if i hide my head it's just your standard calamaris installer Click next a few times. Obviously, you can change location and keyboard. I don't need to uh, erase disk. Now, I've already got an operating system installed because this was an existing virtual machine, but I'm just going to override it. Extend 4, swap to file. Uh, the options, extend 4, butterfs, xfs. I never use xfs these days. Uh, I haven't tried to install uh, that. I have installed ButterFS off this ISO, though it, it installed just fine. I don't have RiserFS as an option. It's really kind of deprecated. Nobody uses it anymore. I also don't have ZFS as an option. You can add ZFS as a, like an experimental option for uh, the Calamaris installer. I don't know much about ZFS because uh, I've never really been a BSD user, where ZFS, of course, is very popular on the BSD side of things. So I'm just going with the tried and true uh, extend for butter FS, but we'll go extend for here. Click next, name and password, strong and complicated password. You know my settings, right? And then install, install now, and away we go. And this will probably take 10 to 15 minutes to install, just like any other Linux distribution, right? Oh. Yeah, Pac-Man is essentially half a package manager made badly, says Big Bud. Oh, be careful there, Big Bud. And I say be careful because the, the guys that work on Pac-Man, I mean, they're, they take their work seriously. I, w I wouldn't call their package manager half a package manager. And I, wouldn't, I would, definitely wouldn't tell them not to their face that they made it badly. Don't go to the Arch forums, Big Bud, or the Arch subreddit and say such things. Yeah, it shouldn't take all that resources to check for updates. Yeah, that's the only thing. Yeah, and if, if you have like automatic updates or you check automatically for updates, one of the th things you want to do is uh, make sure that it doesn't check that often. Like if it checks every hour, okay. Maybe have it only check once a day. I mean, do you really need to check if there's updates available more than once a day. That way, you know, only once, a couple times a day, whatever you have it set to, that's when it checks for updates. And that's for, you know, those 30 seconds or whatever, your CPU spikes to 100%. That way, if you're doing something that is already CPU intensive, like streaming to YouTube, it's not a problem. Or installing this virtual machine. Uh, this, this takes a lot of CPU, right? You can only have so many things going on at the same time, sucking up some of your CPU before one has to suffer. And in my case, if one's going to suffer, it's probably going to be this live stream. So, compiling software, that's another thing. If you're compiling software, it takes a ton of CPU. Uh, that's why it's a really bad idea to do a source-based distribution on camera as far as installing a source based distribution that has to build packages from source on the machine you're also streaming on 
never a good idea. Usually the stream buffers a lot and it's just really bad. You're going to do that, like if you're going to do a, like a live Gen 2 installation on a live stream, uh, SSH into a different machine and do the installation on a remote machine and, and stream obviously on the local machine here, right? Have two different machines essentially, one for streaming, one for actually building Gen 2. Or do it in a virtual machine. If you do it in a virtual machine, just make sure the virtual machine, you know, you, you give it just enough CPU and RAM that it can do its job, but not enough that it's going to hurt the stream. And right now it's unpacking the image. You guys have seen this before. Just taking everything that's on that ISO. It's got to unpack it all. As far as the amount of packages on the ISO, I want to say the package count was about a, a thousand packages, maybe 1100 packages, which is it's actually quite a lot of packages considering I, I don't have many programs installed out of the box. Now, probably 150 to 200 of those packages are Haskell libraries. Xmonad is not on here. Pandoc is on here. Pandoc is a hard requirement for, I believe, the DM scripts, some of the stuff I do with DM scripts. Now, I could get rid of some of those Haskell dependencies by installing pandoc-bin from the AUR. There's a binary package of Pandoc. It's currently flagged out of date. I, I didn't want to use it. Pandoc's pretty stable, just, just the standard Pandoc package that's in the Arch repositories. It just pulls down all those Haskell dependencies. They're not really very big dependencies at all. It has, again, probably 150 Haskell libraries that it pulls down. It looks like, oh my god, it's going to install a ton of stuff. Those Haskell libraries install literally in a couple seconds. Like, you'll just see 100 packages just fly by in Pac-Man. They're installed that quickly. They're really small, you know, just little libraries, just a little bit of Haskell code in each of those files, right? So it's not like they're really, they're not big programs. But, you know, a lot of people see that and think, oh my God, my system's bloated. No, no more than you having, you know, a couple hundred files sitting in your downloads folder right now, right? When you have a messy downloads folder, do you ever say, man, my system's bloated, right? Probably not. And it's going to take a few minutes. I'd say it's about halfway there. Back to the chat here. Is Extend4 better than ButterFS? I, better subjective? I don't know. I would say Extend4 is the older one. It's the more proven one as far as stability. Um, but ButterFS seems to be stable these days. Stable enough that a lot of distributions are starting to now default to ButterFS. OpenSUSE has been defaulting to ButterFS oh, for three or four years now. They were really the one that was out there pushing ButterFS really before anybody else really moved to it. Fedora, I think, now also defaults to ButterFS. I think. Not positive on that. You'll eventually see more distributions pushing ButterFS, mainly because it has that, the ability to take those snapshots, right? Is NixOS a banned word? Well, you just said it on a YouTube stream. Why would it be a banned word? Yeah, I don't know. Currently downloading. We'll try it soon, yeah? Well, I can verify it works because I also... I uploaded it last night. I built the ISO, uploaded late, you know, scheduled this stream. I didn't have time to test it. I got up. A little early this morning, so I could have time to get here to the office. I got here a couple hours before the stream started. I downloaded the ISO. I, I didn't know how long the download from SourceForge would take. Just a couple minutes, actually. Kind of surprised. The SourceForge speeds were pretty quick. Um, and then I ran through an installation already in a virtual machine, and it installed just fine. So I, I know the ISO works. So luckily... I have a pretty good idea what's going to happen once this is done. <laughs> uh, which is not something that 
always happens on my streams. A lot of times I'll start something on a stream and we just wing it and see what happens. <laughs> this, this, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is going to work. And then once it gets installed, obviously we're going to have to cover some stuff. Some of the programs that are installed. Obviously the distribution built around Qtile. We're going to take a look at the Qtile config. Um, and show you exactly how Qtile works, especially if you've never used Qtile. And of course, you probably never used my config of Qtile. Because I do some things maybe a little differently than what the default configuration is going to be. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, obviously the distribution is heavily focused around Emacs. I have a lot of Emacs related key bindings built into Qtile that opens various, uh, various Emacs programs. For example, if you want to use Emacs as a file manager, DTOS can do that. And there's a key binding just to open Emacs Dyriad as your file manager. And things like that. You use Emacs as your terminal. You've got key bindings that just opens the Emacs eShell, for example. Because if you're going to have Emacs installed, pre-installed on a distribution, have it pre-configured, right? Ha have everything set up and actually pe let people use it the right way. One of the things I really hate on some distributions that do, you know, if occasionally you'll find one that already has Emacs installed, but it's just straight vanilla GNU Emacs, you know, with the white screen, that blinding white background, black text. It's not configured in any way. Uh, it looks horrible. Um, you, know, you know, just standard GNU Emacs before you configure it is actually pretty bad. It's a, it's a really bad user experience. All right. We're all done here. Obviously, Calamari's restart now is what you need to click. Now, I'm not going to do that because I have to detach the ISO from the virtual machine. But if you were doing that on physical equipment, you tick the box to restart now, click done and the machine would reboot automatically. But for me, I need to go de detach that. And now let's boot directly off of the drive, the virtual hard drive. And you can see it installed just fine. There's Grub. Once you see Grub, you, you know it worked. So. My coffee's getting cold. I may have to run to the kitchen here at the office. <laughs> You got a microwave, go ahead in the microwave for about 30 seconds. All right, there's SDDM. Uh, and you can see SDDM launched a lot quicker now that it's actually installed. Enter my super secure password. And yep, there's Qtile, right? My Qtile desktop. And matter of fact, let me get out of the virtual machine. This is my real machine, right? That, that's, that's this machine here. Let me go back to the uh, virtual machine on Workspace 5. That's the virtual machine. Uh, not a lot of difference, right? So, DTOS, it really is DTOS, right? It's really what I run. All right, so uh, w when you log in, obviously it detected we were in a virtual machine. And it, since it knew that this was a virtual machine, it automatically changed the screen resolution using the xrander command, right? xrander-s, 1920 by 1080. You know, so that way, you, because I'm going to obviously be in a virtual machine with this ISO a lot, I don't want to have to constantly change that. So also, if you got your conky here for common key bindings, super enter opens a terminal. Super enter standard key binding for most Tiling window managers, especially super enter super shift C to close the window with focus. That's a standard key binding with DWM and Xmonad, and kind of the older crowd of the tiling window managers. And because I've been using those window managers for a long time, especially Xmonad, I've just always stuck with that key binding, and it's pretty easy to hit on the keyboard super shift C. Uh, so super enter to open a terminal, super shift C closes a window, super shift enter opens D menu. So I'm using D menu for a run launcher. Um, super B opens a browser and the browser here used to be cute browser. I've decided to swap it over to brave 
uh, mainly because some people don't know how to use Cube Browser and they want a browser that's just a, a browser like a normal browser, right? <laughs> and Brave serves that purpose and you get to choose whether you want light or dark mode, whether you want to share anything or not. Yeah, I don't care. Not in this virtual machine anyway. And then you get your browser and it's just like any other browser, Chromium base. So everything, everything just works. Or Cube Browser. Cube Browser was cool, but if you're not used to Cube Browser, not used to how the Vim bindings work, even if you are used to the Vim bindings, the Vim bindings in Cube Browser, you still don't know what they necessarily do in Cube Browser. So having Cube Browser as a default, uh, you know, Cube Browser still in the repository. You can always download Cube Browser, right? It's still in uh, the standard Arch repositories. Any, and the browser is one of those things. Anybody that wants a specific browser is just going to go get their browser anyway. So it really doesn't matter necessarily what you ship as default. I just wanted to make sure that at least I shipped one default that actually worked for everybody, right? Grandma can use Brave. Grandma might not be that familiar with Cute Browser. Yeah, Debian is great for a server, but I wouldn't use something with packages anywhere close to that old on a desktop. I, Debian stable works fine as a desktop. A lot of people use Debian stable, or well, I, let me put it this way. A lot of people, a lot of desktop com computer users, a lot of desktop Linux users use Ubuntu LTS. Probably the most popular distribution that people are running, Ubuntu LTS on the desktop. And... That gets support for, well, now it gets support up to five years, but most people are going to run it at least two years, about the length between Debian Stable releases. Debian Stable typically releases every two years, although they're not on a fixed schedule, like a hard and fast schedule. Sometimes it'll release every two and a half years, or three years, or whatever it happens to be, you know, but that's it's the same. So I wouldn't say that, you know, now, it depends if you're buying new hardware, the latest and greatest hardware, you need drivers for something brand new. Like you bought the latest graphics card that just came out yesterday. You know, running an older or older, a more stable distribution can somebody, sometimes be a problem. But Debian Stable is a fine distribution. Nothing wrong with it. On the desktop. I, I've ran it for years. Uh, I've ran Ubuntu LTS for years. On the server, I still use Debian Stable a lot and uh, Ubuntu LTS on web servers. I mean, why wouldn't you on a server? I put friends and family on Debian and Ubuntu-based distros all the time. That's typically what I default to. I never put them on an Arch-based distro. And I put them on things like oh, MX and Mint and things like that, Ubuntu, Kubuntu, things like that. been looking for a pre-configured tiling window manager for uh for my computer i used for my dev work yeah well you can always get a pre-configured uh tiling window manager because you just go to somebody's GitLab and they've already got a config file you just pull down their config file then restart the window manager for the most part now you got to be careful sometimes the configs are out of date especially on you know things like github and GitLab. sometimes that's their Awesome window manager config from 10 years ago. That thing probably not going to work now, right? Make sure it's something they're still using and updating all the time. All right, back to uh, Qtile. So, uh, super enter terminal, right? Super shift C to close. Uh, super shift enter for D menu. Super B for brave. Uh, other than that, how you typically use a tiling window manager as far as the workspaces you could click on the workspaces it does have mouse functionality but super shift 2 will send that window to workspace 2 if i want to move to workspace 2 super 2 takes me there super 1 takes me back to workspace 1 super 2 back to workspace 2 super shift 1 sends that window back to 1 super 1 takes me back to workspace 1 super shift c closes that window let's open a few terminals 
open four terminals and we've got the uh, random shell color scripts that appear in the terminal the default shell your user shell is fish bash and zsh all three shells are installed out of the box so you can quickly change shells if you want and you can quickly change the default shell if you want if you're unsure how to do that uh, let me clear the screen in that terminal uh, oh lol cat i need to add lol cat to the ISO. Well, let's go ahead and do a Pac-Man dash SY LOL cat. I have a fish function that actually requires LOL cat. Now, I probably either need to install LOL cat or just get rid of that function. It's the clear function that gives me <laughs> only works in the fish shell now do i really need lol cat and all its dependencies just for that probably not probably should just remove that function yeah next time i build the iso but i should write that down lol cat as far as an error but where was i going here oh uh, the random shell color scripts uh change shell chsh change shell now if you just do change shell dash l you'll get a list of all the shells See, there's all the shells that are installed on the system. If you want to actually change the shell, then you could do uh, change shell dash s. Let's man c s c h s h. Yes, yeah, specify your login shell dash s. So c h s h well dash s, and then for example, if you wanted to switch over to bash, it should be slash bin slash bash. If you wanted to use fish, it should be slash bin slash fish. Yeah, you got the user bin fish uh, binary here, but use use slash bin slash fish for zsh slash bin slash zsh. So if I do um, slash bin slash bash, I'm going to ask for the sudo password. Let's close all those. And now am I in bash or am I in fish? might have to reboot I think you do have to reboot on that because that is definitely fish this bash does not have the syntax highlighting yeah I think it would require a reboot on that but swapping your users default shell is fine now the default system shell is always bash don't ever mess with that. That's why that's the root user's default shell. Don't ever mess with that. On any system, just leave bash as the default shell on any GNU slash Linux system. Because a lot of times there's bash specific scripting involved to make your distribution work. Like they actually used the bash bang. And in the scripting, they used bashisms, you know, actual legit bash syntax. So don't switch your d default shell the system shell you can switch your user user shell fine you know it, it's not going to affect anything that's why having fish as the default shell not a big deal the default layout here in qtile is monad tall that's the master and stack layout they call it monad tall right you get a master window on one side of the screen and then you get a stack of windows that appear on you know on the other side of the the screen they just get stacked on top of each other that's the standard dynamic tiling layout that most tiling window managers default to it's the one that uh, dwm and xmonad and all the xmonad clones like left wm spectrum WM, all of them default to that master and stack layout it's kind of the standard so that's what i'm going to use even though qtile being an xmonad clone their default config does not even have this layout enabled and they're using a column layout or a stack layout or something which is kind of weird because i think most qtile users probably would find the uh, monad tall layout the one that they're going to be in most of the time this is typically your tiling window uh, layout and, and it makes sense rarely when you're tiling windows a lot of people think tiling windows well you're going to have like a million windows open all the time not on one workspace typically I have a maximum of three windows open on one workspace. And you can see the Monad tall layout works just fine. I have one big window and two slightly smaller windows, but still big enough I can do something with. Now, if I want to open a fourth window, I'll open it. But typically, I'll send that sucker 
to a different workspace. Super Shift 2, I just sent it to workspace 2. You can see the uh, colors I'm using for the Qtile workspaces. The 2 is blue, that means there's something on it, right? So Super 2 to go to workspace 2, I can see there's something on it. I kill that window, now you can see the workspace. Uh, it's now the white color, <laughs> so it's empty workspace. The underline, that is uh, the window that has focus to this monitor. If you had three monitors, like I do, but this virtual machine is not using three monitors, just using one. I would currently have uh, two and three also with a line under them. That line would be green. That is the two monitors that don't have focus, but still, you know, have a desktop on them. Back to the chat here. Yeah, fish is my favorite shell. Yeah. Once you start using fish, it's hard to, to not use it. It's one of those things you kind of get addicted to it, especially the, the history aspect of it. It remembers every single command you have ever entered. And you'll just start typing stuff, and it knows what you want to type before you know it, right? Sometimes you can get a single letter, and it already knows what you want to do. Especially if you have a long terminal session where you've had a terminal open in a specific directory for a while and you've repeatedly done a lot of the same commands, it gets to the point where you only have to type one or two letters. It already knows the command you want in that session. It's just great. Yeah, do you mean the interactive shell? But Bash is still on the system. Not sure who you were asking that to. But yeah, change shell dash s. That's going to change the, your uh, your user's shell. Right? What you log into. If you switch over to the root user, the root user is going to be using a Bash shell. Host Grady, yeah, he helps uh, with the development of the DM scripts, which we should talk about. He says uh, he should download and install DTOS to run the speed test of Comp Edit. Yeah, well, you probably would have to use the uh, Brave browser for a little while in it to actually build up uh, a large database like a history or, or something. But yeah, you could definitely do that. Me and uh, Host Grady, we've been working on some of the DM scripts and one of them as a really nasty bug it makes it unusable for me on my systems uh, because it just times out uh, it just takes forever and a day for the script to run i waited on the script to finish executing the other day uh, and it took well I, I killed it the process after like 10 minutes i waited 10 minutes and then killed the process <laughs> if, if you're executing a script and it hasn't finished in 10 minutes yeah it's it probably never going to to finish executing A problem I have with fish is that nothing else works with it. I'm not sure what that means. Indoor vaping. What doesn't work with it? Um, and I, I've been using fish for a long time. The only problems I have in, ever encountered with fish, there was one tiling window manager that I was using that didn't like fish being the default user shell for some reason. And that's kind of weird. Because most scripts, uh, the system's going to execute whatever script is in the shebang. So if all your scripts have the bash shebang, they're going to execute with the bash shell. But for some reason, I, there was one tiling window manager, it might have been Herb's Luft, that really didn't like it when my user shell was fish. For some reason, I, it, 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 that was an oddball. Um, but other than that... Um, I want to say VIFM, a terminal file manager that I used to use years ago. I haven't really played with VIFM in a long time, but I did some videos on it like six years ago in the early days of the channel. VIFM also did not play well with Fish uh, when you started configuring it. But you could always alias. I, I think what I ended up doing was had an alias just to make sure that anytime I typed VIFM, for example, in the shell, it was really you know, executing bash uh, VIFM, you know, switching over to the bash shell and then executing that command.
Yeah, couldn't you just alias virtual inf? Yep. Um, so yeah, so it was a problem with one particular thing. Yeah, and that's what I had, you know. And it was just, you know, in all my years of using Fish as my default user shell, it was like one or two programs, seriously, that I've ever encountered an issue with. And yeah, setting up an alias is usually the solution. Just to make sure that those things, when you're, if you launch them in the fish shell, it actually switches over to the bash shell. Yeah, host grady, yeah, might be wise to disable the dynamic entries on DTOS. Yeah, that's probably what I'm going to end up doing, or, or I may just remove the script entirely <laughs> from DTOS. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to accomplish that. Um. Probably, yeah, just disable the dynamic ones. Probably. And Zero Lance, please share the ISO build scripts using Arco ones to build or vanilla Arch ISO. I'm just using the Arch ISO to build the uh, ISO. If I get out of this virtual machine, let me switch over to my actual desktop, which looks exactly the same. Uh, let me open PC Man FM. I've got this repository here. This was actually I did not build the ISO on this machine, so these are not necessarily the build files. I, I built the ISO on my home machine. So some of this will be slightly different. I also haven't pushed any of this latest build to my GitLab. But basically it's the Arch ISO. This is the relaying folder. There's the AI root file system. You know, just go in here, put all your stuff. Scale, obviously, it's your skeleton home directory. So when your user gets created, he gets all the configs, all these configs placed in his home directory. That's that's the main thing I had to do was make sure all the configs are there uh, for a, a lot of programs. One of the things I did in the scale directory slash etsy slash scale dot config emacs, I have all my emacs configs. I didn't want the user to have to wait five, 10 minutes for Emacs to build. I've already got Emacs built on my computer, right? Already, uh, the Alpaca folder, the uh, package manager I'm using in my config of Emacs, already got the builds, right? Where I built the packages and they're stored here locally on my machine. Why don't I just put them in slash Etsy slash skill? And that's what I did. If I go back to uh, the virtual machine here, Watch what happens. This is the first time I'm running Emacs. Super EE. -E. Super EE. -E. Did you see how quick that launched? That's because the Emacs daemon was already running. All the packages that it expects to be there are already there because they're, they were in skill. So when the Calamari's installer created my user, it just... This is, and this is actually my config, my key, key bindings. Remember the uh, configuring Emacs series? We've done like six videos. This is that config that existed at the end of video number six. Space FC or find the config.org. This is the Emacs config file as it exists right now, right? With all the key bindings, you go scroll down uh, to general key bindings here. It's all the key bindings I have. A lot of key bindings. I still got a lot more to add. <laughs> well, this is probably still halfway done. Does uh, PC Man FM use GTK3? It does. There is a cute version of PC Man FM. There's a GTK2 version of PC Man FM. And there's this GTK3 version of PC Man FM, which is the one I have been using forever on my desktop computers. So it's the one I stuck with. Uh, the cute version is okay. It's it's not bad. The GTK2 version uh, looks a little old as far as the theming and everything. Um, the PC Man FM package that you get just straight from the Arch repo. So if you just sudo pacman PC Man FM, that's going to be the old GTK2 version, I believe. You have to specifically get PC Man FM dash GTK3 from the AUR. I believe. I don't know. I may have actually been building that myself. It may be in the DTOS core repo. I have to go look. Uh, do you theme cute apps? 
I really didn't spend much time on the theming of GTK and QDAPS. You saw uh, GTK. You know, I, I installed uh, the suite theme and the candy icons, and I did include a GTK3 config file so that all the, your GTK3 apps have that theming uh, for Qt theming. There is Kvantum, Kvantum Manager. Uh, Oh, I did ship a config file for it. I wasn't, I wasn't hundred percent. I had to think about it. I didn't spend a lot of time on theming the actual uh, apps, but yeah, sweet. And it's modified, so I changed some of the uh, settings in here. I think I turned off a lot of the transparency. Um, so what is a cute app? Well, actually, Kvantum is a cute app. I mean, so that's that's the theming right there. Well, uh, I can't use the mouse functions. I can't uh, resize with the mouse in the virtual machine because super and then drag with the mouse actually drags the entire virtual machine because the super key is also the mod key on Qtile on my actual computer, right? Not just the VM. The real way to test these things so that doesn't happen is to actually change the uh, mod key in the vir virtual machine so that it's not the same mod key. Maybe use alt for the mod key <laughs> instead of super. That way you don't have that conflict. But yeah, um, the theming. What else? I don't think did I have any other cute applications. I don't have a lot installed. Uh, when I build the ISO, I have a browser. I have a file manager, PC Man FM. Uh, I have Emacs. Uh, change your GTK themes. LX Appearance is here. Um, and it's a GTK2 application, so I guess... Well, clicking on it, I guess I just haven't, uh, I guess I need to set it the first time so it creates that config file. Where does that put that config file? I'm assuming in .config. Uh, why am I not spelling correctly? Oh. .config GTK3. Yeah, I'm not sure what it uses, where it sets that. But you have uh, Kvantum, you also have Qt5 CT installed, and LX Appearance, so you can do whatever you want with your GTK and uh, Qt theming. I didn't spend, like I said, I didn't spend a lot of time focusing on that stuff, because I just don't have a lot of those kinds of GUI apps installed. Mainly, the focus of this was Qtile, which is not GTK or Qt, and Emacs, which technically Emacs is GTK, but it doesn't really use any of the GTK widgets or anything. Uh, it's just plain text for the most part, what you're seeing. Because um, I have all the toolbars and everything turned off, obviously. Uh, most people turn all that stuff off in Emacs. Conky is also not <laughs> GTK or Qt. Um, by the way, let's talk about the DM scripts. Super P H. Is the DM hub. It lists all the various DM scripts. There's 28 of them currently, although some of them are broken. Uh, well, one of them I know for sure is badly broken. And then um, some of the important ones, how to set a wallpaper. Super P followed by B for background. Set a wallpaper. If you hit set, opens SXIV, which is our image viewer. It's going to take a minute to load the very first time because it has to cache all this. It's 300 and something wallpapers. It's just my wallpapers for repo <laughs> that I got from my dot files. Um, and, and once it's there, you know, just navigate with your arrow keys. Find a wallpaper you want. Maybe this is the one I want. Hit M on the keyboard. M for mark. You always have to mark something in XXIV with M on the keyboard. And then Super Shift C to close. And when you close the window, it sets the background or you could do a random one super p b to run that same dm script and then this time instead of set just do random and it'll just pick a random wallpaper out of that repository or out of that directory super p b random do you like this wallpaper yes or no no let's get another one you like that one no let's get another one no you know you just cycle through them that way so a lot of the workflow 
for this was designed around Qtile being the window manager. You have all these DM scripts, these D menu scripts, which you could also change them to run with Rofi if you wanted to. You'd have to go in and change a lot of key bindings in your uh, config.py, Qtile's config. Of course, and then Emacs is a big part of this. I mentioned we have some Emacs related key bindings. Let me hide my head. Uh, Super EE -E launches Emacs. It just gets us to the dashboard. Super EB launches the iBuffer. So Super EB, that's our iBuffer frame. All the buffers that are currently open everywhere I've been since I opened Emacs. Because remember, the daemon is running in the background, right? The daemon is always running in the background. So Emacs never really closes. And then uh, Super ED is one I use all the time because that is Deer Ed, right? This is the Deer Ed. Oh, manager, close that. And what else did I have set? Super ES for the E shell. So this is the Emacs E shell. Now it works a little bit differently than things like Bash and Fish, right? It's its own shell. It's its own thing, completely written for the most part in uh, Emacs Lisp. Neat little project. But you, if you want a real terminal that runs a real shell, Super EV launches VTerm. It actually launches the dashboard and VTerm in a split. Uh, I need to fix that so that VTerm is in its own window. Uh, let me get hit I on the keyboard to get into insert mode because it uses the evil key bindings, the Vim key bindings, LS. That's LS as it exists in the fish shell because I have it set. VTerm also defaults to the fish shell. Escape to get out of normal mode, right? If I do super WC, closes a window in Emacs. Super shift C, we just close all of this. It has a running process. Kill it. Yeah, sure. It's letting me know VTerm is still running in the background. Do I want to kill it? All right. A lot of that, obviously, is just a workflow. It's a different kind of workflow. If you've never used a tiling window manager, or if you've never used Emacs, uh, I will say for you to be comfortable with Emacs, you need to be comfortable with Vim. Because my version of Emacs uses Evil, which is a, uh, a Vim emulation. Basically, it emulates Vim everywhere where it's possible in Emacs. And it's a really good emulation. Like, it's just like Vim. Pretty much every command you could enter in Vim, you can do in Emacs evil mode. Plus, you also have all the Emacs commands available for you inside Emacs. So it's like you get the best of both worlds. You get everything you want that you loved about Vim. Plus, you can do all the really neat stuff that Emacs can do that, you know, Vim obviously can't do. Uh, if you're running, you know, just your standard Vim or Neo Vim in a terminal, because they're terminal programs, Emacs is actually a GUI program. Even though it just looks, it looks like a terminal program is just plain text. It's, it's really not, right? Emacs is a GUI. All right. That's why I have an image here, right? You can't do that in a terminal, right? That's why I have neat icons. That's why if I do space FC to get my config file, you get different font sizes different header levels have different font sizes you can do that in a GUI application you can't do that in a terminal in a terminal the font size is the same for every character you can't have it's just not the way a terminal works definitely not the way a tty works so why well, i can have a proper web browser inside emacs if if you want uh, the emacs uh browser is not great eww but it's there, and it does display images quite nicely. Okay, Acid Bong, he, he's got a great question here. When you have a key chord in Qtile, does the super key remain pressed with the second key or only with the first one? Uh, just the first one. And that, that's any key chord. Not just Qtile, but any program. Emacs, uh... X head <laughs> anything that accepts a key chord, what they're talking about is you do a combination of keys and then release, and then another combination of keys, and then release, maybe another com you know, again, you just stringing. It's not you got a million keys, you got to hit all at once. So launching Emacs here, that's a key chord. Super E, and then I have the comma, just to make sure you know break. Super plus E, E. Super E. Release, then hit E. 
right? So, or let me get back into Emacs. When I said space FC, that's not space FC altogether. That's space FC. Just type them in sequence, right? Space period on the keyboard uh, here in Emacs is the find file command where I could search for something like my Qtile config.py. Let's zoom into that. So this is the config.py as it exists right now on my system and obviously on this ISO because I uploaded uh, my latest config file to this. And you guys can go in and check it out. Probably a lot more is going to change with this one thing I will say, um, I should talk about this in more detail on a Qtile specific video soon. If I do space period here, uh, you go to dot config slash Qtile colors.py. I created this uh, extra file that gets sourced from the config because I wanted, you guys know in the uh, post installation script of DTOS, I, was, I always had 10 color schemes that you could choose from or XMonad and XMobar and Conky and the Alacrity terminal where you just pick a, a color scheme and everything changes. The Conky changes. I wanted to make sure that that functionality worked in Qtile. So I've got these color schemes to find, the 10 color schemes that we were already using in DTOS previously. And what it does is now when I do super PC, super PC for color scheme, right? Super P is the... Uh, the prefix for all the DM scripts for prompts, right? So super P C for color scheme. If I go and choose grub box, conky changed to grub box, Qtile changed to grub box. If I do super enter, alacrity changed to grub box. Everything changed to grub, grub box except Emacs. And the reason I don't bother changing Emacs to grub box with that script is because Emacs runs as a daemon even if it, I change the config until you kill the daemon and restart Emacs it wouldn't change what you would have to do to complete it don't kill the daemon and restart it that's clunky just open your existing Emacs do space HT HT for help theme is really what it is it looks like some of the icons are not installed but uh, search for grubbox and now we've completed the look. I wonder why some of the icons are not installed. Maybe kill all Emacs. And then user bin Emacs dash dash daemon. Let's restart it and see if it has something to install. Hmm. Didn't install anything new. Now the icons look like they work. Space HT. Uh, it's just the theme ones that don't. Okay, it's just that particular program. Uh, when I restarted the Emacs daemon, it defaults back to Doom 1 because that's in the config. You go to the config and go to theme. This line right here, load theme, Doom 1. If you wanted Grubbox to permanently be your theme, you would change that to Grubbox. Right, you can do space ht to make sure you get the name right. It is doom dash grubbox. Okay, so that would be the thing doom dash grubbox. I'm just gonna leave it as doom one. Matter of fact, I'm gonna set everything back to doom one. Super P C doom one is the first thing in the menu. Let's change it now. I'm back to doom one colors with Qtile with Conky with Alacrity. Now that uh, color scheme script, that is a DTOS specific. When I build the DTOS ISOs, I make sure that that's already on your system and user local bin. Back to the chat here. Now that, uh, if you guys got any questions, No, I neglected the chat for some of this because demonstrating things, you know, you know, some of the tiling window manager stuff, some of the Emacs stuff. Get sidetracked where I talk for a few minutes. Let's see. How's it, DT? That's Alexandros. I'm just lovely this morning. 
It's a Sunday morning. Got my second cup of coffee. Let's see. ADT, should I am new to NeoVim, should I learn it from scratch or use NVChad or Lunar Vim pre-configured NeoVim distributions? I, I can't tell you on that. I haven't used those uh, distributions of NeoVim. Or, or I haven't used them extensively or anything. Um, but, you know, Vim and NeoVim, they, they just kind of work out of the box. They're a little different than Emacs, where Emacs you have to configure for it to be usable. No, there's so much stuff you gotta to do in Emacs. Where I don't have to have a NeoVim config file. Like I could just use NeoVim straight out of the box and just install it, you know, and, and just run it. So do you need a, a distribution of NeoVim? Not necessarily. It's probably one of those things, I've, and you probably shouldn't use one of them until you've used just plain NeoVim for a while. Just learn all the the standard stuff and the standard way of doing things because they're going to install a ton of plugins that heck you may not even need or want or have a use for couldn't you use an emacs client command from a script to change the emacs theme without killing the daemon i could i could do an emacs client uh what is it dash dash eval and then pass along some string of emacs lisp code that it could yeah. Yeah, I could do something like that. Hmm. Yeah, I'll have to think on that. That's a good idea, though. Because what I'm doing now, it actually... I don't know if it actually changes that line in my config file. I could have it change the load theme. Like I can just do a set substitution for that. And then I could pass along Emacs client dash dash eval and then give it the lambda function to restart. Yeah. That's how I could do that. Yep. That way it restarts with the new theme. Also, the new theme is already set in the config file. That way, you know, when you kill the daemon and then restart the daemon or reboot the computer or whatever it is you do, it still is already set in the config file. Yeah. Good idea. I should write all of this down. There were a couple things I needed to fix here. Need to make some notes here. I'm going to open up some notes here. I need to. I need to add lolcat. <laughs> Either add lolcat or remove the fish function that needs it. And then. Um, A color scheme script. Let's see. Have it restart Emacs client. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> no reason to type anything. Very lengthy. All right. Hey, DT, have you ever tried the DK window manager? It's pretty good. Is that one of those Wayland window managers? If it is, no, I, I can't really use Wayland. Right? On my home computer, i got an NVIDIA card. I know people are keep asking me about various Wayland-only window managers. Qtile has the ability to use Wayland. I can't use Qtile on my home computer with Wayland either. So Until, until everything works with Wayland, uh, as far as Wayland and NVIDIA, I, I just can't do it. So it's probably still, I don't know. We've still got some time before all that stuff's going to work, right? I say that because, I mean, we've been waiting for 14 years now on Wayland. And that's come a long way here in the, just the last couple of years, especially. Like, GNOME is practically there. I don't want to run GNOME, though. We're probably still probably a couple of years away before Wayland and NVIDIA get their act together and actually make those drivers and everything work. I mean, that's really what's, what's holding everything back. Until Wayland and NVIDIA work, you know, it's, it's just not, it's just not ready, right? Because <laughs> you're going to have a huge section of the Linux desktop community that just can't use Wayland. 
It's like, and they got NVIDIA cards. So. Yeah, the command is, uh, yeah, the Emacs client load theme. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, and then I'd have to have a separate part of the script. I'd have to do a said substitution to make sure I, I actually change the line in the config. But that is the idea I had there. I'll go ahead and paste your load theme. Yeah, I'm just going to avow that. And write that down in my notes file. Yeah. So already, I mean, we've, we've got a couple of things worked out on this this ISO. I mean, the ISO is pretty good as it is, but, you know, next time I rebuild it, it may be days or weeks away. Uh, I got a lot of, I'm going to find a lot of stuff, little things I need to fix. That Emacs thing to make it work with the color scheme selector here, you know. Uh, but, but everything for the most part seems to work here. I do super PS for search. A search, a search, brave search. Uh, what are we going to search for? How about search for Linux? And that opens Cube Browser. Mm, that's interesting. That's another thing I'm going to have to fix. And that is because the DM scripts config defaults to using Cube Browser for everything. But I thought I had changed that when I built this. I guess I did not. It is there, but it's commented out. That's an easy fix. So for you guys, I wasn't on the scene here, but I did uh, super PS. This is uh, searching, web searching, super PS, one of the DM scripts. I'm going to search Brave Search for Linux. By default, the DM scripts is set to use uh, Cute Browser, which is still installed on the system. I didn't know I actually installed uh, So Cute Browser and Brave are both there. So it's not a problem. You'll, you'll get the search results. But if you actually want to fix that where it actually just defaults to Brave, what you would do, open the DM scripts config. The DM scripts config file lives in .config slash DM scripts slash config is the name of the file. Uh, I've got these two lines in it already. DM browser equals brave is commented out, uncomment. DM browser equals cute browser. Comment that out, right? <laughs> Just change them. Save the config. Now super PS to search. And once again, we'll do the brave search and search for Linux. And now it actually opens in the Brave browser, which is really, it sh everything should default to Brave. Again, it's, that's not a critical bug that it opens in Cube Browser. Cube Browser is installed, so it's not a big deal. I'll probably remove Cube Browser, though, the next time I, I release an ISO. Yeah, DTOS is based on Arch. Well, that was the question. Is it based on Arch? Yes. It's basically just straight Arch for the most part. Um, DM scripts. Let me write a note. DM browser. Set that sucker to brave. All right. Of course, I can't uh, rebuild the ISO. Um, got all the files at home uh, to actually build it properly. I, I didn't build it on this machine. Even if I did have everything, I couldn't actually build an ISO and stream because building the ISO would take 100% of the CPU or it would try to. The stream would be very bad. All right. Have you used Emacs dash? NW, yeah, so uh, that's Emacs, no, no window. That's the terminal version of Emacs. Uh, yeah, sometimes when you're in a TTY, <laughs> you've got no choice. Uh, if I send a key, Control-Alt-F3, you know, to drop to a TTY in this virtual machine, 
let's go back to full screen. Uh, and obviously, launching Emacs as a GUI is not going to work, right? So you would have to launch Emacs dash NW. Now I have Emacs aliased. Emacs on my system, DTOS Emacs is always the Emacs client. So I have this alias, EM. This is for the regular Emacs, not the client, dash NW. Uh, throws some kind of error, but for the most part, I mean, <laughs> there is the dashboard right here. Right, and this is a TTY. This is not even a proper terminal emulator, right? This is the actual TTY. I mean, you can use it. Get out of that split as well. So it's definitely usable when you need it. Uh, but the only time you would ever use it is in a TTY. I mean, why would you? You would never use it if you had a graphical environment available. Because it's, it's so much more limiting than the real Emacs. The real Emacs, the Emacs everybody uses is the GUI. That's right. That's what everything gets designed for. The terminal version, the TTY version of Emacs is more of uh, there for emergency purposes, right? And honestly, typically when I'm in a TTY, I don't even use the terminal version of Emacs. VI or VIM are usually installed in every system. There's VIM or NeoVim is installed on DTOS, by the way. VIM is aliased to NeoVim. So why would I use that uh, horrible kind of, you know, you know, Emacs in the terminal, or Emacs in a TTYs, it's okay. You can use it. But again, I've already got uh, NeoVim installed. So if I vim dash bash rc, this is really NeoVim. Um, yeah, so, and it actually looks better, runs better. All right. Back to, uh, what's the DTOS ISO build repo? Can you share? Yeah, I've got it. It's, it's not exactly what you're saying. I, I've still got to push the latest configs. I built it last night and I didn't do a push. Let me get back to my real machine here. Go to my GitLab. Man, you can go check it out, but again, it's not going to have... There's going to be some minor differences. Uh, go to GitLab, and then DTOS, the DTOS group, and then we've got a subgroup here of other repos, DTOS-ISO. Um, since I pushed a last update 10 hours ago, I might have pushed it. I don't know. I think last night I uploaded an ISO and realized I missed a few things. This might be everything. You can check it out, though. Again, there might be some minor differences, but for the most part, that's, this repo is probably what I did to build the ISO. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, I will link to this in the YouTube chat. Just... So you've got a link that you can click on there, uh, Zero Linux. And for those wondering about some of the source for DTOS, um, obviously that's just building the ISO, building the packages, DTOS-package build is where all the package builds live for DTOS. All the packages I maintain, uh, at least right now. Some of them may be going away at some point because I've... Now that I, I've decided, I, you know, I, I'm not going to have a million different window managers on an ISO, I may get rid of some of the DTOS specific packages for window managers that I don't plan on shipping with out of the box. But we'll see. Uh, DTOS-core-repo is the repository of the binaries. Well, that's all the binary packages. And I wanted to talk very briefly about this. I'm no longer signing packages. 
Uh, for those of you that have already had DTOS installed for a while, I was signing all of my packages. So I build the binary and then you'd also have an accompanying SIG file for them because they were GPG encrypted, you know, um, and that would, th that was causing a lot more headaches than it was worth. For the last two or three years, however long I've been maintaining this repo of software, and the repo actually goes back before I even did the script, the DTOS installation script. And one of the most common issues are key related issues, or signature file issues, things like this with Pac-Man. Uh, and I just got tired of it. I'm just, I'm just done with it. the signatures. They don't really, they're not necessary. For a long time, Arch Linux did not sign packages. It's only been just in the last few years Arch Linux has been signing packages. For a long time, they resisted. And people, hey, everybody else signs their packages. Every other distro, what's wrong with Arch? And I guess to, to kind of, you know, squash some of that criticism, like maybe Arch is insecure because it doesn't sign packages. They started signing their packages. But how many of you guys running Arch Linux have had problems where sometimes... Things are broken. The key ring needs to be reinstalled or reinitialized, repopulated. It can't find signature files for this guy, that guy. And you get into, you got to go and do a Google search for the commands to fix all that. Now, I've had these issues enough. I know the commands. But these are issues that happen all the time on Arch. And by me no longer signing my packages, at least I've eliminated that issue with my packages. You're never going to get an issue with any of my packages anymore where it's a signature complaint or I can't find the key ring for DTOS or whatever it happens to be. You're, you're still going to have that with the Arch packages, but at least I eliminated that with mine. Oh, let's see. Is there a way to increase the swap size without reinstalling just in the partition manager? I have never done that on physical equipment where I tried to repartition something that's all right. You do run risk, a real risk of things going wrong, trying to repartition a drive. Um, if it's the installation of something that you haven't had running very long, it's not like you're out a lot of were like you've already configured things and you're gonna have to back up data or anything like that if it's something you just installed and realized oops i screwed that up it's probably a lot better to reinstall uh let's see zero links oh you open yourself up to a world of hurt remember what i said i hate it on because of not signing packages yeah i mean honestly uh there's uh, there's uh, there's a ton of arch distros out there arch based distros not all of them sign packages <laughs> and I understand why some of them don't. I could always go back to signing packages. It's not like I've, I haven't hadn't been doing it. It's just, man, it's it's you get so many issues, so many support issues related to to that stuff. And it's just when you don't sign the packages, you get rid of all that that support headache. So. Um, security is not necessary. Yeah, right. Hey, big bud, <laughs> if you want to sign your packages, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I could still sign the package. I could make it optional, I guess. And, eh, it's best not to, because then there would be some people that still have signatures being required in their pacman.com, but then they'd have key issues, and then they, they still ask about it. Yeah, it's best just to disable it. Yeah, it's just bad design. Yeah, actually, the, the problem with signing everything, these GPG signatures and the fact that, uh, like using a key server to, to get my key, for example, which is what I was having to do with the post installation script. If I didn't ship like a, a key ring package or anything, just download my key ring from a key server. Problem is there's no good PGP key servers anymore. There's only... There's only really one that actually works these days, I think, and that's the Ubuntu key server. 
And then you run the issue. Sometimes people would be trying to install DTOS. And for whatever reason, the Ubuntu key server was down at the time. They were trying to pull my key down, which means they can't install DTOS. Like, ugh. So then you had issues with that. The, the key servers are sometimes kind of flaky. Having your own key ring works. Um, you got to keep it up to date, though. And even that, I mean, the Arch guys, I mean, they, they should have this down pat, right? But sometimes, yeah, I get issues with the Arch key ring where I have to fix it. It really comes down to keeping your system up to date, too, on an Arch-based system. If you go a month without updating Arch and then try to do a Pac-Man SYU, don't be surprised if you get, like, some key ring issue or some, something weird. Oh, hey DT, how do you feel about dual booting? I, it's not, I'm not a fan. Uh, if you're going to dual boot, make sure you have each OS on its own separate drive. What, when I say I'm not a fan, what I'm not a fan of is I, you've got one big hard drive and you partition it for each operating system you're installing to. That That's a headache and that, that tends to break a lot of times. You're going to have issues where, like, you're, you're dual booting Windows and Linux, right? Grub, you're going to have bootloader issues. But each OS on its own drive typically works a, a lot better. <laughs> Big Pod, Big Pod, you're really on the Pac-Man, guys. Well, it's a half-baked package manager, of course. It's gonna... <laughs> uh. Uh, Tweak says he's repartitioned many times. If your power supply is stable, you should be okay, especially if debating reinstall I'm guessing is what he meant to say if a mistake happens you were reinstalling anyway I mean if, if, you, if you've got nothing already on it like you just did an installation yeah go ahead and repartition see what happens again yeah if it's a fresh install I mean if it breaks it breaks you, you can always go back and reinstall if the repartitioning doesn't work so, yeah just fire up gparted and uh, yeah, see what happens Uh, Zero Linux says, modifying DTOS and building my own system. Oh, well, again, I'm not positive that that ISO repo is completely everything. I think so, though. And the reason I say that is because I've only built these ISOs on my home computer, so I haven't actually tried to do a Git clone and pull everything down on another computer and build the ISO. So... Until I do that, I, I, I'm not for sure <laughs> how that's going to work. But let me know if it works, or let me know if it doesn't work. Either way. What is the DTOS ISO password, DTOS? It automatically pop populates the username as DTOS. The password's DTOS. And after installation, of course, it removes that DTOS live user and... The only user on your system is the one you create during the, the Calamaris install. Uh, Barco says, sometimes you lose the kernel when Arco does a kernel update. Yeah, Eric has videos on how to root and fix it. Yeah, I've had that. Uh, I, I haven't had it where I've removed the kernel for some reason. Um... Uh, some people do that because, you know, remove a package or for whatever reason it thinks the Linux kernel is a dependency and removes that too. That can happen sometimes. Uh, I think what probably Eric's talked about is sometimes you have an update of the kernel go bad or you have an a interruption of the update. Because I had that. I, I did a video about that three or four months back where I had a kernel update go wrong and I had to do the arch root method of, yeah, get back into the machine using a live USB stick, chirrut into the machine, sudo pacman dash s Linux to reinstall the Linux kernel, unplug the USB stick, reboot, you're back again. 
That does happen. That's not a that's not an Arco Linux problem. That's not an Arch Linux problem. That's just a you know you can have an update go go horribly wrong on any system if for whatever reason your computer crashes, there's a power outage, whatever it happens to be during the update process, especially involving the kernel. The most recent kernel broke keyboard support on newer Lenovo laptops. Had to downgrade. Oh, wow. Was that uh, an LTS kernel? I typically boot into the LTS kernels. On. I have both kernels installed on my system, just so I have two different kernels. Because sometimes one will be acting funny, or you know, maybe I want to switch over to the other one. But if you look at the top of my screen, you can see. LTS kernel, what I'm running now. If I go back to the VM, we're just running running the standard non-LTS kernel. That's the uh, the DTOS VM. So open a couple of terminals here. Talk about key bindings here in Qtile, at least my config. Let's talk about shrinking and expanding windows. So the window with focus, if you do super plus, well actually it's super equals, but you know, plus and equals are on the same key, but super equals expands it. Again, you can think of it as super plus, super minus, right? Super dash, right? That's the window with focus. So if I switch over to the other window and super plus or super equals and super dash, you know, so you can resize those however you want. That's in the monad tall layout. There are other layouts. Let me open up four windows. The layouts I have enabled out of the box, monad tall is the default on all the workspaces, but super tab will cycle through the layout. So if I do super tab, that's the max layout. All four windows are still open, but they're all on top of each other in the max layout. Uh, super J and K will cycle through the stack, right? Now, uh, super tab again. Next layout is the stack layout where we have two different stacks of windows. We have this window that that's the only window in the stack. This window over here by super J to go down in the stack, super K to go back up through the stack. You know, all those three windows are on that stack there. Super tab for the next layout, the columns layout, which looks like more like a master and stack layout. I'm not really sure what the columns layout. That's one of the default layouts that's available in Qtile. I never use this layout and I'm not really sure how that differs from the monad tall layout now that I'm looking at it. The tree tab layout, which is a really funny looking layout that I may do a video on it at some point because it's kind of weird, kind of neat. Uh, I, I've done some configuration to it. The zoomy layout is really weird because you've got one big window and then hard to tell because of the cocky, but you got three, these three windows, super small, right? And you see when I hover over them, the one I hover over gets replaced into the big window, right? And it's just going to have a stack of windows. So if you had 20 windows open, there'd just be the stack of 20 small windows over here. That's kind of a neat layout. I don't know how useful it, it would be to most people, but I thought it was so neat I had to have Zoomy enabled out of the box. Well guys, we've been going about an hour and a half. I like to keep these streams to about 90 minutes to ensure the sync over to Odyssey goes properly. So uh, we'll go a few extra minutes here. Let's give it about five more minutes. I'll go another five minutes. And you guys in the chat, you got any more questions or comments? Let's get them all in before we're done here. That way they can forever be recorded in YouTube history. So. Uh, let's see. Hey, DT, if you use the DTOS installation, would you be a distro tuber? <laughs> If you want to call yourself that. Uh, let's see. DTOS becomes an OS? Oh. Well, there's an ISO out there for you. Let's see. If we use the DTOS installation, 
Yeah, time to rebrand to Distro Tech Tips. Okay. Uh, uh, you did not mention it had PAMAC. Yeah, I included PAMAC for a GUI package manager just in case some people wanted one. There could be people trying this out that have no idea how to use Pac-Man at the terminal. So it's there. Does it actually work? It's telling me I have updates. Let's click on it. I never use PAMAC. It just check for updates and it found four of them. Let's apply. Enter our uh, sudo password. It's refreshing the DTOS core rep repository. And system is up to date. Oh, well, it works. But yeah. Now the reason I didn't mention PAMAG is not something I would use. Uh, that was a question from Zero Linux. And the reason he's asking about that is PAMAG uh, is kind of funny. Sometimes it's broken. Or trying to build it on Arch-based distributions, which of course he maintains Zero Linux. Sometimes some of the dependencies for PAMAG are, are wonky, out of date, broken. You can't get everything to build properly. Because I've tried to, well, I think I've been maintaining package builds of PAMAC and Octopi and things like that for DTOS for a while. They just haven't been something I install out of the box. They've been in the repos, though. Are there any DTOS guides for Linux beginners? No, I, I need to... There are some DTOS guides for the old post-installation script, but I'm probably going to quit doing the post-installation script. At some point, that's another thing. We're just going to get rid of the post-installation script because, again, it's, people are trying it on so many different Arch-based distributions, and that it's, it's, it was a neat idea, and I wish I could make it work, but it, it causes more support requests than, than I have time for. Having an ISO that's just built on one distribution, it's built on Arch, just go grab the ISO. I know the ISO kind of works, right? Where the post-installation script... I don't know. Depending on what other distributions are doing, could have some conflict. So, but yeah, eventually we need to get some proper documentation somewhere on a website, create a DTOS specific website, or even just use GitLab, which right now uh, I don't have anything on GitLab referring to this. I just built this ISO and uploaded it yesterday. So we got to get some documentation. Eventually, I'll probably create an actual application using GTK or probably Qt where you have an application that you could launch for DTOS related documentation like a help application. It'll give you all the key bindings, help you figure out how Qtile works and Emacs works and everything like that. And that way you can have it right there on the distro itself. But I, that's That'd be a project that'd take a little while. It's not something I, I could get done tomorrow, right? Really, it's going to be hard to write documentation until I get a lot of a lot of bugs worked out. Because I'd be writing documentation on how to fix things that are broken now that won't be broken probably the next time I, I build the ISO. Uh, Pac-Man dash S McDonald's. No, we didn't do McDonald's. I'm telling you, Whataburger. It's better breakfast. I think I like McDonald's coffee better than Whataburger, but it's not bad. Install didn't work for me. Gave me a grub error. That's quad feed. Uh, were you installing DTOS? Um, and what were you installing it on? Uh, physical hardware, virtual machine? Uh, if it's virtual machine, what virtual machine? Virtual box, Burt Manager. Gave you a grub error. That is interesting. Proxmox. Uh, can't test it on Proxmox. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that error would be. But maybe somebody else can and help me out with that. Yeah, Eddie says, I'm stuck on Linux for about eight years now as my primary OS. It's amazing that my HDD and network does nothing as long as I don't do anything, as opposed to Windows' latest releases. Yeah, 
but you got a lot of extra background services on Windows that are constantly running. So yeah, you're going to have a lot less issues going as far as, you know, system resource usage on Linux, any Linux, no matter the desktop, even some of the heavy desktops like GNOME, way lighter than Windows, right? Yeah, Proxmox is KVM based and Vert Manager is as well. Yeah, I mean, I've done plenty of Vert Manager installs and they just work. So I don't know. I haven't tried it in VirtualBox, but I would assume it works. If, if, if it installs properly in Vert Manager, I can't imagine why it wouldn't in VirtualBox. And it'd just be weird because, I mean, why would Grub be an issue specifically on Proxmox? Like, that's, that's a weird issue. I could understand if it was like a video driver issue between different kinds of virtual machines. That makes sense. Why would Grub be broken? That could be a, a, a bad download. Yeah, maybe. But he, not, but he was able to install. I mean, he's talking about Grub, and he's talking about he already installed it and rebooted, and then he gets a Grub menu. Or doesn't get a grub menu. I don't know. That's yeah, a weird one. I don't know. QAMU, yeah. That's what Vert Manager is using, yeah. ADT, is that true that Linus and friends will rewrite the Linux kernel using Rust? I don't know if they're rewriting anything in Rust, but Rust, yeah, you going forward, some things can or will be written in Rust. Which makes sense. Rust, popular language these days. A lot of people learning Rust. A lot more people probably can help with kernel development if they can submit patches using Rust rather than C. How many people know C? You know, obviously, a lot of serious programmers know C. But how many people know Rust? Probably a lot more, right? these days yeah I'll never understand how grub is as popular as it is refined is better yeah I mean refine I don't know if it's better it's another option uh, because calamaris is very messy oh uh, yeah and so he's saying you can consider using Jade from Crystal Linux I don't know Crystal Linux, so I guess they have a, another installer, Jade, instead of Calamari's. I don't know. And a lot of it, what, I don't, what are they basing off of Crystal Linux? Because if they're not basing off of Arch Distro, then it'd be a lot of work to make that thing. Like if they were basing off of Debian or something, you know, Debian and Arch under the hood are very different, so it'd be a lot of work involved. Something like that, but I don't know. I, I don't know what Crystal Linux is. Should write that down. <laughs> Since I don't know what it is, might be something worth taking a look at at some, some point. Let's see. Get my uh, my notes up here. I'll make a note. Crystal Linux. Hmm. All right. Does DTOS use Wayland? Well, there's nothing Wayland installed. Qtile has Wayland support. Not my Qtile. <laughs> Not the config that we're looking at. Um, partly because I can't really test it if I wrote it to be used for Wayland. Again, I have an NVIDIA card at home on my home computer where I do all of this work where I actually play, you know, I, I just use this computer here at the office, which has an AMD card. I just use this mainly for coming up here and recording and, you know, actually doing stuff, playing with stuff, you know, I do at home, usually in the evenings on my home computer, I can't use Wayland on that computer. But if you go to the session here, click on it. Oh, it's really slow in this VM, this animation that should pop up. Don't know why it takes this long. That's probably a issue with the driver, the video driver here in the VM. But uh, Qtile Wayland is an option. But with my config, if you clicked on it, tried to log in, nothing's going to happen. 
there's nothing nothing gets installed with Wayland. Uh, I didn't install Wayland anything, <laughs> any kind of Wayland packages in this VM. So it's just going to be a black screen. So let's drop to a TTY if it'll let me. Well, the VM's really frozen up. It's not even going to let me switch to the TTY. I may just have to force it off, which is fine. We were here at the end of the stream anyway. So uh, Wayland, what you would have to do is you would have to inst install Wayland, obviously. You would also have to hopefully have your own Qtile config that you have already configured and you know works with Wayland uh, before you install DTOS. You basically, you, could, you couldn't use my config, right? And you, now, at some point, I may actually make it so it does, or, or at least it's halfway usable with Wayland, because Qtile does have Wayland support, so at least it's kind of future-proof in that way. Like When, when Wayland is ready, Qtile will work on Wayland. Um, and people do run Qtile and Wayland. You'll find people online when I'm searching for stuff, Qtile-related issues and things. People are using Qtile on Wayland. Uh, not, not on NVIDIA, though, so... Yeah. Crystal Linux is Arch based and the back end of Jade is Rust. Front end is Python and GTK. Okay. Well, if it's Python and GTK, that, that's very easy to work with. Uh, Zero Linux, DT, don't touch Wayland. I'm, I didn't install Wayland on this ISO. I, like, it's one of those things if somebody knows their computer will work with Wayland, their hardware will work with Wayland, and they're okay. Configuring Qtile to work with Wayland, they can go do that. Uh, but just putting it on the ISO, knowing it's going to be broken, knowing people are going to complain about it, and that's another thing. Uh, by default, Qtile Wayland would be the default session that appears in SDDM. I changed that. <laughs> so Qtile Wayland, there's an option for it. It's not the default. Uh, you would have to go looking for it. And again, if you choose it, you'll know it's not going to work. Not right now. Uh, unless you make it work. Yeah, host Grady, I've sim simulated your situation by creating a bunch of files, and wow, it's slow as F. Yeah, he's talking about the DM scripts, the comp edit. Um, I hate to run it on this stream because it may suck up a lot of CPU. It will run forever, though, on this computer. Uh, I'm not even going to do it. I, I was going to demonstrate it. I was going to launch that specific script. It's just going to run forever. Now I'm talking about forever. <laughs> It'll way longer than 10 minutes, which is when I killed it the last time I tried to run it. But you can see, like, CPU and RAM users, like, it's trying to, to collect all this data. There's, like... Two and a half gigs of data in a folder that that particular DM script is trying to cycle through so you can search through it. That's a lot. That's a lot for a D menu script. Uh, all right. A couple more minutes, guys, and then I got to get out of here. DT, have you ever tried Gparted Live? I have. It's really weird and wacky Debian based distribution. I don't know if it's weird. It's, it's for a live. Uh, uh, ISO. It's it's a rescue distro. It's not it's not meant to be used like a desktop distribution. I don't know about it being weird. It's just a a rescue Linux distribution. And there's a lot of them. There's the Gparted Live one. There was a the System Rescue CD. What, was that Gentoo based? I don't know. Honestly, I just use Ubuntu LTS as a live USB stick when I need a rescue stick. I always have a USB stick of Ubuntu LTS anyway because people want to try out Linux. People want me to install Linux. It's usually the one I'll put on a computer because it's just it just works and it's easy to use, not Arch based, right? But the Ubuntu LTS uh, USB stick works fine in rescue situations, just like any Linux distribution. Let's see. DT, have you tried out Vertigo as an alternative to Ivy? I haven't. 
he says it's more lightweight and works better. Maybe. Um, maybe I'll try it at some point. But, you know, I'm, I've been using Ivy. Ivy was kind of a default on Doom Emacs when I started on Doom Emacs like four years ago. And I think Doom Emacs now has the ability to swap between some of those completion frameworks. But I'm just used to the, some of the Ivy tools, so I just stick with them. Uh, as far as being lightweight, I, I've never had a problem with anything I'm running with Ivy, you know, like being heavy or anything, but I don't know. See, the comparison is like over a minute versus a few seconds. That's host great. He's still talking about the DM scripts. That's really, really slow. If it was over a minute, then that's still a really small folder. Once you have a real history of stuff going on in dot config, that particular script, it's just not going to run anymore. It's just it's going to be way too long for anybody to, to wait and actually time. All right, guys. Well, let me go ahead and get out of here. I appreciate you guys. Um, before I go, though, one brief thing. For those of you that wanted that ISO over on SourceForge. Now, this link is in the show description, right? Go to Files. Click on the ISO. Download it. If I hover over it, 52 of you guys have downloaded it. Well, it was only like 20 of you guys had downloaded it before the stream started. So a lot of you guys are, are downloading that ISO. Yeah. Try it in a virtual machine, you know, see if you like it. You know, if you got test equipment, install it, you know, whatever. Essentially, at the end of the day, it's mainly Arch with just a few programs installed. I mean, it's got a, a the, the ISO is three gigs, but it's really not a lot of stuff installed. You get Qtile, you get Emacs, some of my programs, DM scripts, shell color scripts, which aren't big packages at all. Um, the Brave Browser. I mean, that's <laughs> it's about all you get. So. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys for hanging out in the chat. As always, you guys, your comments, your questions were always great. Before I go, of course, I need to thank the patrons. I want to thank Daniel Gabe, James, Matt, Paul, Royal, Wes, Armour, Dragon, Commander Henry, George Lee, Methos, Nate, Urion, Paul, Peace, Archon, Fedora, Reality, Spur, Les, Red, Prophet, Roland, Souls, Azure, Tools, Devler, Warge into and Ubuntu, and Willie. Man, some of these guys, these names, Warge into and Ubuntu. Please tell me that's not your Christian name. Your mama did not name you Warjento and Ubuntu. If she did, ooh. Uh, <laughs> I also want to thank each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. Uh, all these names you're seeing on the screen. Yeah, these guys. These guys are awesome. And other than that, these guys. Warjento and Ubuntu.